Well, good evening. Welcome to our seminar on being safe on the internet. My name is Steve Hudgick. I'm glad you all could come this evening. And we're going to be talking about the internet, internet fraud, scams, and how to avoid them. We're not going to teach you how to do fraud. We're going to teach you how to avoid internet scams. I'm the, uh, you could say the pastor, I'm the head elder for the English church here at Cannon Beach Bible Church. So what is a pastor doing talking about staying safe on the internet? Well, I spent 20 years working in, uh, with computers, a programmer, web design, web programming. Uh, I owned a company where we sold on the web. I sell a lot of things on eBay right now. So I'm familiar with working on the web and to keep my own company safe, I had to learn how to protect it from fraud and scams on the internet. And also, you should know, I'm a paranoid. And it's really good to be a paranoid when you're dealing with the internet, as you'll see here this evening. One sure way, I'm going to give you a hint right here to start off, if you want to avoid problems on the internet, the one sure way to do it, if you want to avoid fraud, scams, viruses, all that stuff, all you need to do is never, ever, never, ever connect your computer to the internet. There you go. Then you'll be safe. So uh, let's talk about being safe on the internet. Oh, if you didn't get any notes, we have notes available on our website. Just go to this web address right here, cbbc.us slash internet. I haven't got them on the site yet, but I'll put them on there probably at the bottom of the page. So you may have to scroll all the way down on the page to get to the notes. But the notes for tonight, you don't have to write anything down. Everything that's on the screen appear in these notes. So uh, you can just get them if you don't have a copy. So here it is, staying safe on the internet. Here is an outline of what we're going to be talking about this evening. We'll be doing some definitions in case you don't know all the words we're talking about. Then we're going to talk about email safety. We'll talk about browsing the web safely. We'll talk about virus, virus and malware protection. After this morning's seminar, I went home. I wanted to make a post on Facebook about uh, the morning seminar. And boom, something popped up that was trying to trick me to install a virus on my computer just right after being at this seminar. Good thing I came to the seminar this morning and learned what I had to say. Anyway, you can learn, uh, we'll learn how your computer, uh, learn how to know that your computer is infected, how to tell if your computer is infected, learn about computer security and safe shopping on the web and how to protect yourself from identity theft. So let's get started. Definitions, malware. That is a word, it means software that is intended to damage or disable your computer uh, to hurt you in some way. A virus, that's a type of malware that makes copies of itself to infect computers. Trojans, that's a type of malware that steals information about you, steals your identity, steals your bank account information. Phishing, that word's pronounced phishing, it is an attempt to trick you into giving out important information such as usernames, passwords, social security numbers, and the details of your credit cards. Essentially, they're casting out with a lure, trying to catch you and get you to give away that information. And spam, that's any unwanted emails, usually solicitation emails. These are the most common ways that people get a computer virus. Number one on the list, and we're gonna talk about email a lot this evening, Number one on the list is clicking without reading. And that's either in email or browsing the web. If I had clicked without reading on what appeared on my screen this afternoon, I would have got a very serious virus infection. Or logging into an account from a link that you receive in an email. Say you get a, an email from your bank and you click on the link. We're going to talk about that. Very important. Opening email attachments or links that are posted in social media. Second most common way to get a virus. Third most common way of getting a virus from free online games, from pornography sites, gambling sites, music and movie pirating websites. They pretty much target vices. They target our vices in order to get you to do things that will put a virus on your computer. Not having antivirus software installed. Clicking on pop-ups that claim your computer is infected and downloading infected software. So these are the things we'll be talking about and how to protect yourself from getting a virus on your computer. So let's talk a little bit about email safety now. There's two ways that you can get your email. One is using online services such as Gmail, Yahoo, Live, 
which is uh, Microsoft, or using software or on your phone, they're called apps that, that you have on your computer, and that would be software such as Microsoft Outlook, Thunderbird, Apple Mail. They go online, get your mail, and then uh, retrieve it so that you can read it. Uh, with services such as Gmail, they come, in, come with a lot of built-in spam protection, virus protection built-in. If you're using Outlook, Thunderbird, Apple Mail, in those cases, you have to do some of the configuration yourself. But let me ask, first off here, who likes to get spam? Anybody here wants to get more spam? No? No? Okay, we're going to talk about ways to reduce the spam you get and how to deal with the spam you get. Number one, number one thing to do is you should have two email addresses. These are the two email addresses that I have. Okay, why two email addresses? You should have one email address that you use for all of your online shopping, for setting up accounts, for subscriptions online, everything that you do online, you should have an email address that you expect to get a lot of spam at and then you can deal with it there. And then you should have a second email address, which by the way, right there, stephenh at gmail.com, that's the email address I use that just collects a lot of spam. And then you should have a second email address, that's mine there, steve at mta, mtainfo.com, and that's when you only give that one out to people that you know and trust, to your family, to your friends, people you know that won't share it somewhere else so that you start getting spam. So you have one email address that'll stay nice and clean, and that one you can use for all of your important correspondence, and another one that you use for shopping, subscriptions, whatever else you're doing online, and that one will collect all the spam. And generally, you don't have to even look at this email unless, for example, say you buy something from Amazon and it doesn't show up. So you, you go and you check and see what emails you've received from Amazon about that product. It's you know, delayed shipping for whatever reason. So what do you do? Most of you have one email address that you're using now. How do you get switched to two email addresses? Well, there's only two options. You can take that email address that you have now and make it into your spam email address that collects all the junk, and then you start up a new email address that you give out to your friends and family, and that becomes your private email address that cuts down on all the spam coming in. Or the other thing that you can do is just leave it as it is and deal with it. It may not be worth the effort to have a new email address. And by the way, we're going to be talking about a lot of things that you can do. You do not have to do any of these. It just depends on how much protection you want. If you really have a big problem with tons of spam that you're getting, then yes, go ahead, get a new email address, leave the old one for your shopping, and have the new one for people that need to get in touch with you. Talked about uh, Gmail providing you a lot of protection. This is a spam message that I received in my Gmail account. It's now in my uh, spam folder. And it has a warning on it. And it says here, be careful with this message. Similar messages were used to steal people's personal information. Unless you trust the sender, don't click links or reply with personal information. So this is not trying to install a virus or whatever. It's just telling you that this link, a link in this email, may lead you to a bad place. So you get that kind of protection with using a, a service such as, uh, as, such as Gmail. But let's take a look at the characteristics of spam because uh, it's very easy to end up opening emails that you shouldn't open. You can even get emails from your friends, your family, and uh, it's very easy. For example, I could fake I could pick any one of you, get your email address, and then send emails to all the rest of you as if they came from that person there. It's very easy to fake the sending email address. So let's look at some of the characteristics of spam so that we can identify uh, where there might be a problem. First rule, though, do not just open emails. As emails come in, don't just automatically open every email and look at it. If that's your normal practice, you probably have viruses on your computer right now. When an email comes in, what you want to do first off is look at who sent it. Who is the email from? Let's blow that up, get a little bit closer view there. Who sent this? Do you know the person? For example, do I know Mr. John Paul? No, no, I don't know them. Even if you know the person, let's say it comes from somebody and you recognize their name, 
and think, and you're, you know, would, would I be getting an email from Dave, from my, Dave, my friend Dave, and the subject line is, hey, click here to learn about some hot Russian babes. You know, would Dave send me that email? So first, you look to see who they're from, and then if it looks like a, a valid email from somebody that you know, you go and you look at the subject lines. Here's a couple of typical subject lines that typically will be a problem. For example, that one from Mr. Jean Paul that I mentioned, contact Speed Trust Company for your delivery. They will send spam emails that make it seem like you have a package coming to you, they weren't able to deliver it, uh, it's not uncommon to see it from FedEx. Hey, FedEx is a trusted name. Sure, open that email and it'll say, you know, contact FedEx for delivery of your package or contact FedEx. We've been unable to deliver the package. You open up the email and it will say, we've attempted delivery several times. We're unable to deliver this. Then it'll say, click on an attachment, click on a link, whatever. They're going to try to get you to click on something. You should know FedEx, UPS, the post office, none of them will ever, ever send you an email telling you that they could not deliver a package. My wife even used to work for FedEx. They do one of two things. They'll put a sticker on your door. You probably have gotten one of those stickers if you're not home telling you we attempted to deliver a package, could not deliver it. And if they still cannot deliver the package, they will call the person who sent the package and get information from them, whatever information they, they need in order to get the package to deliver to you. But they will not send an email. If you get any emails about packages that cannot be delivered, delete them. Get rid of it. Credit cards for you. Congratulations. We have a new Visa or MasterCard available for you. Kind of playing on your pride. Hey, I'm special. They're going to give me a credit card just for no reason at all. Watch out for those. Credit card offers, any types of thing. Oh, you have been selected to win a prize. You're the 10,000th visitor. You get a prize, whatever, that comes out of things that you had nothing to do with. They're just trying to trick you into opening it and doing something. This, this is one of my favorites. I've always wanted to be a product tester. Yeah, send me your free computers. I'll test them and tell you what I think. And what happens is here, wanted tablet testers, what they'll do is they'll offer you, you get, you get a free tablet, all you need to do is test it, tell us what you think, and then, hey, you can keep the tablet. And then there'll be a form you have to fill out on the website, you know, your name, your address, credit card number, just in case something happens, you know, we wanna, we, you, you know, you, if you break the tablet or whatever, we may need to charge you for it, whatever their reason. You fill it out, fill out the form, click submit, and you're waiting for your tablet to come. And it never comes. And you look at your next credit card and go, oh, wow, $26,000 worth of charges on your credit card bill. They're trying to trick you into giving away your information. By the way, I'm a pastor. This is a church. And the Bible actually tells you everything you need to know to avoid all of these email scams as well as almost any other fraud or scam on the Internet. Because they all target our vices. Or just about all of them target our vices. And for example, the Bible says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It doesn't say money is evil. Being rich is not a problem. But the love of money is the root of evil. In other words, greed. Keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. One's pride will bring him low, but he who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor. Pride. They will play on your pride. Oh, you're special. And try to get you to open an email that will install something bad on your computer. So, let's continue looking at spam subject lines. These are all in your notes, so I'm not going to go through all of those. I just want to point out a couple of things here. For example, here, the way this date is written, 3.20.2015. By the way, all of these are spams that came into me on March 20th. That's when I got, uh, got all of these. But this, with the dots in the date, doesn't that look a bit odd? Well, that's, like, that's the European way of doing dates. Here's the American way of doing dates down here, 3.30.2015. This tells you that this came from somebody outside of the U.S., doesn't really go with this subject line. You would think this would be from somebody in the U.S. So that's a hint. Don't open it. It's coming from somebody who is not native to the U.S. and doesn't know the way we do dates. Also watch out for things like uh, this one here. Warning, you car warranty is expired. 
you car warning bad grammar bad spelling that's an indication that it's a problem it may be coming from a different country something to avoid okay don't open them just delete now I'm gonna look at some examples of spam anybody here have a friend named Dave anybody know Dave yeah yeah just about everybody knows Dave Dave sent you an email this is from Dave hey hi how are you have you seen this oh it must be really good it was shown on Oprah must be really good you open this email from Dave boom click on the link bam something bad's gonna to happen to your computer they're trying to get you to click on the link look spend a little time looking before you click on anything in the email first of all Dave does that look like Dave's email address well that's kind of a weird email address doesn't look like Dave and the subject line does Dave normally in the subject line of his email put from uh, Dave doesn't make sense who are all these other people here you know, these other people that you know no on the two line they're making it look like Dave sent this to a bunch of people but you don't know any of those so don't just open emails oh it's from Dave click on the link this one is going to get you into trouble here's another example hey this is an email I got from the FBI headquarters in Washington DC it's an important email they have written to me to tell me that I have won a sum of eight hundred thousand dollars and in the words that you can't see here what happened is they couldn't get the money to me so it's been put in a bank account and the FBI was notified that it's undeliverable and if I will pay them just the fees that have accumulated because of the the time they've spent processing this hundred and twenty dollars they will give me the eight hundred thousand dollars okay if you believe that oh no but that's not the reason why I'm showing you this one notice there's just a blank square up there and that's where an image should be all of my email software is set to not display images when you open the email it will not display the images that's actually very important by displaying an image bad things can happen one of the things that can happen when you when the image is displayed whoever sent you the email can get a signal that says oh you opened this email at a minimum what that does is tell them you're a person who opens spam emails send you more spam send more spam this is somebody who looks at spam you don't want to have that you don't want more spam also opening an image can install cookies or read cookies set cookies on your computer okay so what's a cookie okay computer cookies cookies are used to store information about you to track where you've been on the internet and to record what you have been doing have you ever noticed for example that you go to a, one of your favorite websites and you log into the website and you get on there you do whatever you do and then you come back the next day and you're already logged in you can just go ahead and start doing whatever you do on that website that's done with cookies the cookies remember who you are so that when you come back so they can they can do useful things to make it convenient have you ever noticed this though if you go to Amazon and look at a certain product or go to eBay look at a certain product and then it seems like everywhere you go on the web there's ads for that product it's just kind of like everywhere you go it's like what's going on why, why are they offering me this product everywhere it's because of cookies they can follow you around on the web and place ads on those websites offering a product that they think you are interested in so cookies can be used to do things like that they can be used in most cases to improve your experience on the web making the web easier to use or they can be used to collect information about you information that you may not want given out by knowing which websites you go to and look at they can actually put together a pretty accurate picture of who you are so that's what a cookie is so going back to uh, we were looking at that FBI email with the image on it if that image displays it can set a cookie all of my software is set and this is Google this is the Google settings page so you go to Google setting go to the general tab go down to images and be sure there's a little dot next to ask before displaying external images and then what happens is when you open your email there will be a box where the image should be and there'll be a little button and you just click on the button and boom the images appear so if you're getting an a, uh, email say from your daughter saying hey here's the pictures of your granddaughter you just click on a button and the pictures will appear but if it's a spam you have the option of not clicking on that button and you don't display the images here's another thing that's very very important there is a spam email comes from Lord and Taylor 
and it's, uh, the images aren't showing in this one either, but it's got a link here to shop online. So, oh, I got, a, got an email from a Lord and Taylor. Yeah, I, I, I like, I want to buy some of these shoes. So you're going to click on this link. Do not click on links in emails. By clicking on a link in email, that gives permission for whoever sent the email to install whatever they would like on your computer, including viruses. So what the first thing you want to do, okay, you're really interested, you really want to click on this link. What you do is you put your cursor on this link, and down at the bottom, the address of where that link leads to will appear. And so we can see, look in the lower left-hand corner, you can see that this, e this uh, link goes to lordandtaylor.com. Good sign. The email is from Lord and Taylor. The link goes to Lord and Taylor. That's a good sign. It's, it's probably okay to click on that link. A better thing to do is instead of clicking on the link, just type in lordandtaylor.com in your browser and go there directly instead of clicking on the link. However, if you put your cursor on the link and it says something like this, blackhole.com slash virus slash installer, do you want to go there? No. And by the way, some of the people who make viruses are that arrogant. They will put it at a place like this and essentially go, if you're stupid enough to click on it, then you deserve to get a virus. And, and in many cases, they feel like they're doing you a service by teaching you a lesson. Do not click, click on links in emails because something bad will happen. And they, they think they're doing something good by messing with your computer. Many cases, though, this, when you put your cursor here, it won't be something this obvious. It might be like Lord and Taylor shopping store. So go, oh, yeah, that's Lord and Taylor shopping store. No, it's somebody else who has set up a website. It may look exactly like the Lord and Taylor website. You go to it, you buy the shoes, and once again, they get your credit card number, and you get a big credit card bill as they enjoy their vacation in the Bahamas. So, Never, never click on a link in an email unless you are 100% certain it is safe. Here are five signs. We've been talking about doing things with email that might result in a virus on your computer. Here are five signs. How do you tell if you've got a virus on your computer? Number one, your computer runs very slowly. Programs run much slower than they normally did run in the past. Your computer starts crashing, it starts freezing, just kind of general slowing down of your computer. Now, here in Cannon Beach, sometimes our internet runs a little slow. This is not talking about browsing. It's talking about loading normal programs uh, on your computer. There are times just when the internet's going to be slow, and that's just the way it is. Pop-up ads start appearing more frequently. These are things that just pop up in your browser. And, you know, normally you might get one or two a day as you're browsing, but all of a sudden it pop, one pops up, you close it, another one pops up, and they're just popping up all the time. You probably have a virus. That's what they do. Programs that you never installed start appearing on your desktop. You know, you know boy, I didn't install that program. Where'd that come from? That's probably coming from a virus. Lockdown warnings. This here, you probably can't read it on the screen. This is a lockdown warning. Looks like it comes from the Department of Justice, Federal Bureau of Investigation. What this lockdown warning says is that it, they have detected remotely that your computer has been used for child pornography, and if you do not pay a fine immediately, there's some kind of penalty, I can't read it in here, but you need to pay a fine of $500, and then that will unlock your computer. And here where I've blurred it out are the links that you click on to pay your fine. Okay, what's going on here? Yeah, you know, they're, they're going to take your money and you get nothing. Actually, probably what you get are more viruses. This is a virus trying to trick you into paying a fine. There is no way that somebody can remotely lock down your computer. So that means you've got a virus. If your regular programs and screens start looking different, they just don't look the way they used to. Now, programs do get updated regularly, automatically. But if it's just looking different and it's more than one program is starting to look different, then you may have a virus. Essential functions don't work. An essential function in Windows would be something like Task Manager. In, uh, on a Mac, it'll be Spotlight. Task Manager is used to look at what programs are running. So obviously, if somebody's running a virus on your, on your computer, they will not want you to know that it's running. So they will make Task Manager no longer function correctly. Five more signs your computer is infected. 
You notice a new toolbar or links or favorites showing up in your browser that you didn't add. You didn't do anything to add them. Okay, what is a toolbar? Toolbar. Here's a Yahoo screen. This part here is, a, is an ad. But the toolbar, it's that purple circle with the Y in it all the way across. That's the Yahoo toolbar. Now, is a toolbar bad? Not all the time. Yahoo, to Yahoo toolbar is fine to have installed. And what a toolbar does is it gives you access to features that you commonly use. So it makes it very convenient to, to use some things that you normally use. So with the Yahoo toolbar right there, you can search on Yahoo just by typing it in that box. It also gives you some of the other things, the current temperature where you're at. There's a link to Facebook, a link to YouTube, a link to eBay. So it, it gives you some convenient things. But if toolbars are appearing that you didn't install, there's probably a problem. Next on the list, your home page, mouse pointer, or default search programs are changed. If you are, are usually always searching with Google, use that little search box in the upper right-hand corner or wherever it is in your browser. And all of a sudden, instead of going to Google, it goes to some search engine you've never heard of before. It usually won't be Yahoo or Bing. It'll be something you've never heard of. You go, I didn't change that. So you change it back to Google. And five minutes later, it changes back to that other search engine. You probably have a virus. You type in a specific web address, but end up at a different website. You type in www.amazon.com, and you end up on some weird website that uh, didn't even know what it was. You see pop-up ads even when your computer is not connected to the internet. Pop-ups come from the internet. If you're seeing them when your computer is not connected to the internet, you've got a virus. And your computer starts overheating. I've only really seen this one one time. I had somebody bring me their computer. They said, oh, this is running really slow, having some problems. And when it turned it on, the fan started running. This was a laptop, very similar to this one that I have here. And the, the fan started running. It revved up to the high speed. You can't hear the fan on my computer. On that computer, you could literally hear the fan rolling, roaring. If you put your hand on the side where the air was blowing out, it felt like you could easily barbecue hot dogs on the heat from that computer. What was going on is the computer had so many viruses and trojans and malware installed, all these bad programs were all running at once. They were overheating the processor. The only way to fix that computer was to wipe the hard disk and start over. I was able to get the data off of the hard disk, so the data was saved, but then the computer just had to be wiped and then we just start over fresh. So if your computer is really overheating, it's really running hard, and all you've got running is a word processing program, could have a virus. So what if you think your computer is infected? What do you do if you think you've got a virus? Number one, disconnect it from the internet. Viruses, in many cases, will start downloading more things from the internet, installing them on your computer, and making things even worse. Disconnect it from the internet. That means turn your computer off. Uh, I, I did, I made a mistake and uh, clicked on something I shouldn't have. We're going to talk about that later on. And I got a virus on a desktop computer. What did I do? The first thing, I actually just pulled the cord out of it, pulled out the power cord, shut it down before it could do anything connecting to the internet. You know, it's one of those things where you do something and you go, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Get the computer turned off, shut it down, shut off your router, shut off your modem, do whatever you can. Get it disconnected from the internet. And then once it's disconnected from the internet, in your computer, turn off your wireless card or however it's connected to the internet. Turn that off so you can now turn your computer on, you can turn your router back on, and everything is running without that computer connecting to the internet. Now you've got the computer running, run the virus checker that comes with your operating system. Every operating system, Windows, Mac, comes with virus protection. Run that. In Windows, by the way, it's called Windows Defender. Run that, see what it finds, and let it clean it up. Run the, virus and ch run the virus checker that you have installed on your computer. We're going to talk about those shortly, if you have one installed. If you don't have one installed, install it and run that, because it will catch more things than what the one that comes with your computer will catch. And if you still have problems with the computer, get help. It just may be more complicated than what you can do on yourself. For example, the note here, may be more complicated requiring root kit removal. Root kits are really messy things to deal with, very hard to get rid of sometimes. And uh, that just takes somebody with some more experience. So that's basically what to do 
if you think your computer is uh, infected. Which, by the way, if you, you do these things, you run the virus checker, it's not finding anything, the operating system's not finding anything, uh, just kind of watch your computer without it connected to the internet. If it appears to be running fine, doesn't appear to be a problem, go ahead, get it connected to the internet and see what happens. It could have also just been, sometimes computers just go, yeah, brain dead and uh, do weird things. So it, just rebooting the computer may have fixed the problem. Okay, now we're going to take a look at some other examples of email. We're going to take a look at phishing. This is where, peop where people are trying to trick you into doing something that you ordinarily would not do. Now here's an email that says the ACH transfer recently initi initiated from your online bank account was canceled by the Electronic Payments Association. Please open the Word file given here to get more details about this issue. There's a problem at your bank. You did something, you made a deposit, made a withdrawal, cast a check or whatever, and it, it, something went wrong and you need to get it straightened out. So you open up that attachment and Word documents can put viruses on your computer, or that may not even go to a Word document. You don't really know for sure where that goes. It, it could be something that tricks you, but I can tell you for sure something bad will happen because your bank, no matter which bank you have, will never send you an email like this. Your credit card company will never send you an email like this. If you have a problem, sometimes they'll call, sometimes they'll send something in the postal mail, depends on how serious the problem is. They will not send this type of email. This is a phishing email. They're trying to get you to do something and they're going to look to be stealing your banking information. Here's another one. These types of emails typically were coming out a lot when the uh, new healthcare sign-up period was going on. They're trying to trick you into uh, thinking that you're getting healthcare. First, look, look at this. This is the second notice. You're getting your second notice about Aetna Health Premiums, a 50% discount. You missed you missed the first notice. What's wrong with you? Don't you open your email? You missed your opportunity to get a 50% discount. Good thing there's a second notice, right? No, there was never a first notice to start with. And look at it. It's from Aetna, second notice about Aetna, then down here further. They talk about Humana, then Coventry and Humana again, and Kaiser. All these different big name insurance companies all in one email. They're, they're not going to send out one email for all these different companies. If Kaiser wants to uh, get your business, you're going to hear from Kaiser. They don't want a, a chance of you talking to their competition. So right away, that's a tip-off that this is a problem. And uh, what they're trying to do is get you to click on this link right down here, uh, probably even clicking on the link with my uh, email address in it. They click on the link, and it'll probably take you to a, an insurance sign-up site. It'll look very official, may even have some government seals on it. And of course, you know, to get started, you enter your name and your social security number, and you click on uh, Submit, and I will bet that what will happen is, if, if you do that with this, it'll say, System overloaded, unable to proceed. Something about the because we've all heard the healthcare computers are overloaded, right? And what's going on is they wanted your name, social security number, maybe your address, whatever they collected. Your ID has just been stolen. They have no reason to provide any more of a website. It doesn't matter when you go to that website. It's always going to say that it's overloaded. If you call this phone number here, it says, uh, you know, this should give you more confidence. If you prefer to speak to a representative, please call this number. Uh, I bet you if you call that number, all you'll get is all lines are busy, please wait, and click, they'll hang up or whatever. They won't even stay on the line. So th the whole point of this email is to trick you. Here's another one. I love this one. Breaking Fox GMO release blacked out. This is, this, is, this is something really cool. Look, at it. it's an astounding scandal that was recently exposed, a conspiracy between the U.S. government and the largest food producers in America. Scandal reaches the highest levels in government, and it's so controversial that it was even banned from airing on Fox News. Even if Fox News won't show it, this has got to be juicy, juicy. This is appealing to our desire for gossip and to know information, know things that other people don't know. When you click on this link right here, there may be a sign-in that you need to sign into the news site, and they'll steal your information. Clicking on that link may install a virus, which, by the way, going to a website, just doing that alone, going to a website that's been set up a certain way, can install a virus on your computer. 
Uh, so they are looking, again, they're taking advantage of our desire for gossip in order to get us to do something that's going to be harmful to us. Here's a, 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 a typical email, and you notice the part I've got circled at the bottom. There's a federal law, it's called the CAN SPAM law. All solicitation emails must have a way for you to request that you be taken off their email list so you won't get spam anymore. So right, you don't want to receive these anymore, you just, in this case, click on the, uh, the cancel link, right? Well, first off, you notice most of the spam we've been looking at does not have a link to unsubscribe. Spammers don't care about following the Can Spam Act. They're already violating a number of other laws, so they don't care if they have that link in there or not. And the spammers that do put it in there, when you click on that link, something bad will happen to your computer. Never, never, never click on the unsubscribe link in an email. Except, except if it is an email from a, uh, a company or a service that you are sure that you signed up with them. For example, if you sign up with a news service and you're going to get their daily news announcement and every day you're getting it and you decide, well, I really don't want to get this, so you click on the unsubscribe link. That's okay because you know you signed up for it, so then you can unsubscribe for it. Other than that, never click on the unsubscribe link. That will just lead to nothing but problems. At a minimum, it signals that you read spam and send me more spam. Maximum, it could just totally make a mess out of your computer. So that's it. That's our look at spam. So let's summarize how to protect ourselves from email. Number one, in the yellow to the left, do not open spam. It doesn't matter how good the deal sounds, how curious you are, how interesting the, the subject line is, don't open spam. That's the best way to protect yourself. Number two, check, check the links before clicking on them. Put your cursor on the link and see where that link is going to take you before you go there. A better option, don't click. Just type in the website into your browser and go to it directly. Do not automatically display images in emails. That can, as I said, they can start tracking you with cookies and it just says, hey, I open emails. It'll send a signal to the subscriber, to the, it'll send a signal to the person who sent you that email. Do not unsubscribe from emails. Do not open attachments unless you know for sure it's your granddaughter's photographs. Unless you know for sure. And by the way, if you're not sure, you get an email and it comes from your daughter and says, here's some more photographs of your granddaughter. And you go, boy, this doesn't look right. This isn't the email address she usually uses. It's something d d weird. What you can do is you can just shoot her an email, say, hey, daughter, did you just send me some pictures? And you get an email back, no, I didn't. Oh, they're trying to trick you. So you can always check if you need to check, if you're not sure. If you ever get this little nagging voice, you're looking at an email and go, hmm, something's wrong here. I don't know what it is. Check on it before you do anything. Be wary of any requests for personal information and be wary of anything, anything that appeals to greed, pride, revenge, sex, or gossip. And be very wary of any emails from your bank, credit card company, FedEx, or any trusted source like that that requests that you click a link. They, none of those, none of those will ever send you anything requesting that you click a link. And finally, watch for language that does not seem natural as though it was written by a non-English speaker or watch for dates that don't look like they come from a uh, English speaker. And watch for offers from major companies they will always uh, have correct grammar and punctuation. If they don't, they are probably not from that company. So that's email. By the way, since you've been to this seminar, don't be confident you now have all the answers and you're safe. Always be alert, be wary, be cautious. Read before you click or open an attachment. Read before you do anything. So let's move on to text messages. Just going to talk about these briefly. Your phone is a computer too. And text messages can carry viruses. Often, they're phishing type things. They'll be offering uh, free gifts, most often gift cards, cheap mortgages, debt relief, credit cards, computer products. They'll ask you for personal information so that you can claim your free gift or discount. Remember, if you think you're getting something for nothing, you're going to get something for nothing, but it's not what you expected. It'll probably be a virus. Do not give out bank information, never. Give out your bank information, credit card information, social security number, 
your income information or not even your job information in response to a text message. Clicking, just clicking, tapping on a text message can install malware that steals your identity or uses your phone. On older phones, they could even, with your, with your phone turned off, they could turn on, if they installed the right virus on your, uh, uh, or right malware on your phone, they could turn on the camera in your phone, turn on the microphone, and be watching everything you're doing, and you think your phone is turned off. And it can lead to unwarranted charges on your phone. They could then, uh, then send, essentially use your phone to route phone calls so you get charged for them. can slow down your phone just like a computer. So what should you do with suspicious text messages? Delete. Never, never, never reply to them. Okay, we've been talking about viruses, and I'm sure you've heard about virus protection software. So if you've got virus protection software on your computer, you're safe, you're protected, right? Well, virus protection software will partially protect you against things like viruses, spyware, annoyware, malware, and it gives you limited protection against Trojans and phishing. Phishing, they're not even trying to install something on your computer in many cases. They're just trying to trick you into doing something. And software cannot protect you from being tricked into doing something. So they do provide a lot of protection, not 100%. You, you have to be alert and aware of what's going on. This is PC Magazine, so this is for Windows, which by the way, we're going to talk about Windows virus protection now. We don't have time to go into Mac virus protection, but it's, a, it's the same thing. It all works the same way, and many of these same brands work on Mac and Windows. These are all in your notes if you can't read the screen, but these are free. These are free, doesn't cost you a thing, and uh, you get full virus protection, but you don't get all of the features that the, the software may offer in the, in the paid version. So what we have here, malware bytes, that's actually one I'm trying right now. Um, I was using another program and my subscription ran out. I do pay for virus protection software. I like to get the best. And I didn't really like that company that I was using anymore, that software. So I've been trying out several. And actually malware bytes is looking uh, pretty good. So I've been trying out their free version, but probably any one of these here. Which by the way, you notice malware bytes anti-malware, and then over here, malware bytes anti-exploit. They do different things, and you actually need both of them installed. And many times, one program is not going to fully protect you. And even with both installed, you're still not fully protected. These are the paid versions, the top five best paid versions of virus protection software. Notice WebRoot is number one on the paid versions. And malware bytes, this, this, this gets me a little confused, because malware bytes number one free doesn't show up anywhere here. Webroot does have a free version. I tried it and I didn't like it, but they're the number one version that if you pay for it. So I get a little confused. You know, you can't, you, you, you try it and it looks good, but then if you pay for it, it's not so good. So I still haven't figured that out, but I, I think you'll find if you, if any of these that you try on this, Webroot is, is okay, Malwarebytes is okay, Bitdefender, any of these are okay to use on either the free or the paid ones. Only one I'd be a little leery about is Kaspersky, Kaspersky, or however you say it. It's from Russia. And that worries me a little bit from everything I've heard. It's, it's okay, it's a very good program. And I, by the way, I've been to Russia many times. I have a lot of good friends in Russia, but right now I'm not sure I want a company based in Russia having full access to my computer. By the, whoever supplies your virus protection software has everything they need to know to get around your virus protection software and access and use your computer for whatever they want. And I'm just, just not comfortable with that, uh, with Kaspersky anymore. Kaspersky, I guess it is how you say it. Now, some virus protection software does more than just detecting viruses. This one here, notice it's got a little green check mark. Notice, I did a random search for a random search, is what we got here. Uh, and notice there's a green check mark next to random search. The virus protection software is checking the websites that come up in your Google searches, and it'll do the same thing in Bing and Yahoo. And it puts a green check mark saying, yeah, that's a safe website. You can go there. Notice there's one with a little orange circle, or, or uh, yeah, it's orange, with an exclamation point. That's caution, you may not want to go there, and the ones that are dangerous will have a red circle. So it's trying to 
do some things to prevent you from doing something that you wouldn't want to do. It, it cannot stop you from going to any specific website, but it can put little markers on there to warn you uh, that maybe you don't want to go to that website. Now here's some really dangerous stuff. Fake virus warnings. These are, you'll just be browsing the web and boop, up pops something and it tells you you've got a virus. In fact, after this morning's seminar, I went home, I wanted to post on Facebook about how it went this morning, and I typed in, I, I usually just go direct, typed in www.facebook.com, and boop, up comes a warning telling me that this website that I'm trying to go to may have some problems. We'll look at that in a minute. What it was, was a fake warning though, and I'll, I'll show you how I, I could tell that. On the upper right hand corner, hey, your PC may not be backed up. Somehow they're detecting that your PC is not properly backed up. And if you click on this uh, link right here, you'll get your PC properly backed up. And that's important to have a backup. Because if you lose your files, you lose everything if you don't have a backup. So you want to do that, right? No, don't do that. You click on that, it's going to install bad things on your computer. Now this one though, this is from Microsoft. Microsoft Security Essentials Alert. It looks just like the Microsoft Security Alert screen, and uh, it's found a virus on your computer. It's popped up, and yeah, you need to do something about it. Here's the button right here, clean computer. Yeah, click on the clean computer and get your, your computer cleaned. You do that, and what this is going to do, it's not going to clean your computer. It's going to install more viruses, and then what will happen is it'll, it'll tell you, yes, cleaning done successfully. Then 10 minutes later, whoop, it pops up again, and then you got four of them there. And by the way, the virus warnings are all fake. It's just trying to get you to click on the button and install more bad stuff on your computer. So how do you know? I mean, this looks somewhat like a Microsoft Security Essentials alert. How do you know that this is a problem? Well, let's talk about the one that popped up on my computer today. I was going to go to Facebook, and this popped up. This is what the screen looked like. This is my browser. So within the browser, this popped up as I was trying to go to Facebook. Let's blow it up so we can see it. And it says, this web page has been reported as an attack page and has been blocked based on your security preferences. So normally what you want to do is just click on get me out of here, right? Well, get a little suspicious. Let's go back and looking at this full page, notice you know, my browser is here and... Uh, if, well, this, this is the test you do to find out if this is a real warning. What you do is, first of all, look at, well, where did I go? And let's go back to the, the big one again. Where did I go? Oh, I went to Facebook. I have a typo there. I have F-R-A-C-E. I didn't go to Facebook. I went to Facebook. Okay, that's a little suspicious, but maybe Facebook is a bad website. If you're Virus protection is giving an alert like this. It is a pop-up that is separate from your browser. What you do is, go back to this one, click on the X in the upper right-hand corner of your browser. If the alert ever has an X in the upper right-hand corner, don't ever click on that, because clicking on that X can get you into more trouble. Clicking on anything on the pop-up can get you into trouble. So what you do is you essentially you just shut your browser. And if this disappears when you shut your browser, it was a trick. And you know what? I shut my browser, this went away, it was a trick. They were trying to get me to click on any of these buttons or even on this link down here and clicking on any of those would have installed bad stuff on my computer. So that's how you tell whether it's a trick or not. You click, you close your browser. If it goes away when you close your browser, it's a trick. If it stays on your screen, it could be legitimate. But let's look at this other one too. When I had the other three on here, here's a warning with nothing to click on and it's got a phone number to call. It says your computer is infected. They have somehow remotely determined that your computer is infected. You need to call this phone number. What happens when you call that phone number? They're going to say, yes, we have detected. We're a Microsoft certified provider. We've detected that your computer has a virus on it. And what you need to do is go to such and such a website and download this and it'll clean it up. And you know what you're doing? You're downloading a virus and installing a virus on your computer. So you don't want to do that. In fact, there's even a scam 
where you'll get a phone call from somebody and somebody will say, we have detected that there's a virus on your computer, there's a remote virus, and uh, we've been hired by Microsoft to clean this up. And they'll tell you that same story we just told. You need to go to this website and do this or do that. And what they're doing is either stealing your information or installing a virus on your computer. If you get something like this and you think it's legitimate, never call that phone number. If you really feel you need to call somebody, call the company that made your virus protection software get their phone number from something separate. Don't trust that as their phone number. Use another computer to look up their phone number on the web. Look on the box that the software came in, however you get it. Call them and they're going to probably go, yes, that's a trick, and they'll tell you what to do. Uh, never, never call that phone number that's on the pop-up. Now here's something, it's not dangerous, but it's really irritating. It's called uh, we call them just non-virus, undesirables, junkware, bloatware. And the most common place to get these are from Java or Adobe Flash Player. And what it is, for example, this is the screen for installing Java for the first time. And in many cases, by the way, if you don't need Java, don't install Java. Java opens the doors for bad things to happen on your computer. If you install Java, you really need to know how to configure it to protect yourself. But when you first install Java, let's say you're going to go to this website and it says you must have Java installed. So always read the screens. Don't just click through them. So as you're installing Java, this screen comes up and notice right down here about uh, two thirds of the way down, it says install the ask toolbar and make ask my default search provider. So if you don't take the check mark out of that box, the ask toolbar is going to appear as a part of your browser. Now, that's not harmful, but it just adds bloat to your computer, things that you don't want. If you want to have the Ask toolbar, go ahead and install it. But in general, it's just adding stuff that you don't want. So you'll be sure to remove the check mark from that box. And you'll get the same thing. It seems like Java needs to be updated. I mean, it seems like every week I get a notice from Java, I need to update it. And when you do the update, same thing. There'll be a checkbox and they'll be trying to install the Ask toolbar. Same thing with the Adobe Flash Player, the Adobe Reader. Here they're trying to install the McAfee Security Scan. I believe this is the update screen for uh, the Adobe Flash, Flash, Flash Player. Remove that check mark uh, where it says, yes, install McAfee Security Scan Plus. If you already have software, uh, virus protection software on your computer, you don't want a competing one. Sometimes the two virus protection software programs will keep detecting each other and you get all these virus warnings that aren't even real. So you don't need Mac McAfee. If you've got something already installed, take the check mark off of that, okay? For more information about this stuff, here's a good website, scamwatch.gov.au. It's an Australian government website. I'm not going to read through all of this. This is in your notes. Uh, but really good information on protecting yourself on that website. So now let's take a look at just internet security. We're getting close to the end here. Some of the things you need to do to protect yourself on the internet. Number one is to have strong, unique passwords. Unique means a different password for everything you do. Oh, how do I do that? How do I remember all those passwords? I'll show you how to remember all the passwords, but for now, you need strong, unique passwords. By the way, there is new security coming, new types of security that will do away with passwords, make things easier. But for right now, mainly we're still dealing with passwords. A good password has numbers in it. It has capital letters and lowercase uh, letters in it. It has special characters in it, like the dollar sign. Never use your pet name. Never use family names. Never use any dictionary words. A dictionary word is any word that is in the dictionary. They can actually try to crack into your accounts, and they'll do this. They'll put in, you know, find, like assume that your username is your uh, email address, because that's common. And then they will try every word in the dictionary. And computers can do this very quickly to try to get in. They'll try every word in the dictionary as your password. And they'll try to get into your account that way. It's called a dictionary attack. So don't use any dictionary words. Here is a secure password. And you look at that, you know, capital letters, numbers, special characters, you go, huh, I'll never remember that. Well, especially since you have to have a different one for every account, there is software to help you deal with this. 
Here are two programs. These are in your notes, Keep Pass and Last Pass. What they do is they will remember all of the login information for all of the websites that you go to and you need to log into. So when you go to that website, it'll just automatically log you in. And then you have a master password that gives you access to this. It won't work until you put into your, your master password. I use uh, Firefox as my browser. It has a password manager built in. Internet Explorer also has one built in. In Firefox, I, when I start Firefox, it comes up and asks me for the master password. I put that in, and then everywhere I go, it automatically enters my username and password. Except, I never do this with any password that goes to financial information. So my bank accounts, credit cards, uh, anything that's financial, I think I have about five accounts. I have, first off, remember I said have two email addresses back at the beginning of this presentation? Well, I actually have three email addresses. My third email address is used just for financial websites. I don't, I don't tell anybody what that email address is. And I have unique passwords for each of my financial websites. And they are, they are not kept in my password manager. The only place they're kept in is up here in my head. And, and actually, well, I was going to say, I, I don't think my wife knows the passwords. I, you know, I've told them to her. They're not a secret, but I don't think she remembers them. But I also give all of my passwords to my son. He's somebody that I trust. He lives 1,200 miles away from here. So if something happens to us, he still has access to all of our uh, information. So that I keep very, very secure that way. Also, as you do things on the web, it is actually possible to intercept whatever you do on the web. And uh, it can be read by uh, other people. So there is a, a secure system. For example, if you go to your online banking, you'll notice that on the, the left up in the, in the address box in your browser, it'll say HTTPS. The S on the end means secure. And there's this little program that you can get from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. They are a nonprofit. And if you put this little program on your computer, it will ensure that if that website offers a secure connection, that your computer will use that secure connection. So it's just a handy little thing, just runs in the background, you don't even know it's there. And this is how you can tell a secure website from a, just a regular website. Notice this is the, uh, the website we were just talking about, and notice their website starts with HTTPS. This one on the right is our church website. We have no reason to secure our website. There's nothing, uh, it, nothing you can do on the website that you need security for, so it just says www.cbbc.us. So that's just a handy little utility to have to ensure that when you need security, you've got it. Let's talk a little bit now about safe buying on the web. We're going to talk a little bit about auctions. I'm, one of the, I'm a top-rated eBay seller. I do a lot of selling on, uh, on eBay. That's actually how we support ourselves or pay our bills. Uh, so I'm familiar with eBay. On eBay, you're fine. Uh, buying stuff on eBay, eBay gives you a lot of protection. Go other places, go to uh, auction sites you've never heard of. You want to check them out before you start giving them money. For example, you want to understand how the auction works. There's many different ways that auctions can work. So read the information on how the auction works. Find out how the website handles problems. For example, can shipments be insured? And the way you do that is just send them an email and say, you know, what, what, how, how is this type of problem? Send the seller an email. Uh, you know, you send an email to eBay, I don't think you'll get an answer back, but you send it to the seller and say, you know, if, if I have a problem, uh, you know, you know can, they, can, can your shipment be insured to be sure there's no problems? And by the way, that, uh, I had another one here, I thought. Next, then learn about the seller. Then learn about the seller. Examine the seller's feedback. See what kind of feedback they have. Determine what type of payment method is required. eBay, pretty much everything has to be paid through PayPal. And that's safe. eBay actually owns PayPal. That's safe. But you know, if you go to an auction site and they're saying, well, you need to send a money order to pay for this, mm, I don't think so. That's not going to happen. In fact, purchase using a credit card. You should always use a credit card. Now, on eBay, PayPal is fine. But 
in most other places you should use a credit card. Why? Because if something goes wrong, you make your purchase, you don't get the item, you have 30 days from when you receive your credit card statement to put in a dispute, and almost automatically, if you put in a dispute, you will get your money refunded by the credit card company. They just take it right out of the seller's account and give it back to you. Be very cautious with sellers outside the U.S. You have very little recourse with a seller outside the U.S. If they scam you, it's gone. And never, never, never give out your social security number, driver's license number. Never, never do that. Safe buying on the web, kind of talking about delivery. This is auction sites, any type of shopping sites. Buy only from reputable sources. If you're buying from Amazon or eBay, you can uh, be sure things will be okay. If you're buying from a place that you don't know, get their physical address. It should be on the website. If not, uh, send them an email, see if they'll send you the physical address. And then look at Google Street View and see what they look like. I did that once. I forget what the name of the store was, but I went on Street View, looked up the address, and it was a mailboxes, etc. store. So they were using that as, uh, as their mailing address. And I go, I don't think so. It may be legit. It may not. Depends, you know, if, if you're buying something for $1.29, it might be worth the risk. But if you're buying some jewelry for a couple hundred dollars, I don't think so. I'm not going to send it to a company based out of mailboxes, etc. Send an email to the seller just to see if you get a reply. A lot of times, fake shopping sites will be set up. People will buy things. They give the credit card numbers. And those shopping sites will only be there for a few days, a week at the most, and then they're gone. They collect a bunch of credit card numbers, and then they're gone. So you want to see if there's really a person behind this website. So you send them an email, see if you get a reply. If the reply comes from, and it's a store, and it comes from a Gmail account or Yahoo, you're not too sure about that. That could be anybody. So you want the email to actually come from the store. Check with the Better Business Bureau in the seller's area. You're buying something of significant value, check with the Better Business Bureau where the seller is located. Check other websites with a Google search. Now, how do you do that? Let's say that we are buying a chair from Fred's Comfortable Chair Company. So what you do is you type into the Google search, Fred's Comfortable Chair Problems, or Fred's Comfortable Chair Scams. And anybody else who's had a problem and it's been posted on the web, it'll probably come up. So that would be how you check other websites to see if there's problems with this seller. And by the way, don't judge the seller by the quality of their website. It's very easy to make a really good looking website. It doesn't mean you've got a good, good uh, trustworthy uh, seller there. Ask about returns and warranties. And do it by email. Don't do it on the phone. Do it by email so you have an email back from them saying this is what, your, what their policy is. So in the future, they can't say, oh, well, we didn't really say that. Well, no, here it is. Here it is in your email. And again, use a credit card because you can always get your money back if something goes wrong. We could talk a little bit here about identity theft. What are the ways people can steal your identity? Shoulder surfing is one of them. That's just somebody looking over your shoulder. You're in a coffee shop and you're just checking your bank account balance. Somebody actually pretty far away can be looking at what you're doing and uh, get your login information. Dumpster diving, that's kind of the old way of doing it, of going through the trash and pulling out information, uh, old bank statements, things that would give away your identity. But the number one way that identities are stolen now is via the internet. Internet phishing. One of the major dangers on the internet. What do they do is they try to trick you into giving out personal information. We saw that in some of the emails that we looked at with links, attachments, uh, that will install a Trojan, for example, on your computer. A Trojan is like a virus. It's a program. But a virus is usually self-replicating and spreads around. A Trojan gets on your computer. And for, for example, a Trojan could be on your computer. Everything that you type on your keyboard, every keystroke would be recorded and sent to somebody in China, for example. And then they get all your information when you log on to your bank account. They get what website you go to and all your login information that you type in. That would be what a, one of the things a Trojan could do. Fake websites. We just talked about those a little bit. Fake online stores. Fake bank sites. You do your banking here with U.S. Bank in town. They can build a website that looks just like 
the U.S. Bank. It'll duplicate everything on the U.S. Bank website, at least on the home page. You go to log in, and you'll get some kind of error message, but they've just stolen your login information for the bank. And by tracking your internet activity, it's amazing the picture somebody can put together of you by tracking the websites that you go to using cookies. They can, they can draw an amazing, accurate picture. They will try to steal your personal information. Public internet connections. When you are down at insomnia having your morning coffee and you're just kind of checking your stuff on your computer, I can come along with a computer and monitor everything that everybody's doing on the internet in that room. And I can even focus in on your computer. That is an open internet connection, public internet connection. There's no security at all. So I can log into that and find out what you're doing on your computer. Never, for example, look up your bank information. Never check your bank balance when you're in a public place, a coffee shop, an airport, a library, any place where there's a public internet. Trojans, we've talked about those, programs that can get installed on your, on your computer and steal stuff. And another common way is just through lost and stolen computers, phones, and hard drives. Somebody steals your computer, which by the way, you, know, you, you, you think your computer is safe, you've got a password to get into your computer, those are very easy to defeat. You can get past, there's ways to get past your computer password. So essentially, consider anything on your computer is open and available. If somebody steals your computer, they're going to get to it. What I do is I use a, a little, uh, it's a USB hard drive. It's uh, called Western Digital Passport. I get the two terabyte Western Digital Passports. And I save all of my crucial information on that external hard drive. So if somebody steals my computer tonight, you pretty much all you're going to get is you'll get this presentation we're doing tonight, you'll get my Sunday sermons. Hey, you know, go for it, enjoy yourself. All of my important information is on an external drive that is password protected, very hard to break into, and then I actually can store those in fireproof lock boxes. I don't know if the, the, the fireproof box will save them from a fire, but it does make it more difficult for somebody to take them and they generally no, don't get carried around when I'm going places. Uh, if you just have everything on your laptop, everywhere you go, you're bringing your valuable information, somebody steals your laptop, they got it. And that's one of the very common ways of uh, identity theft. So, whew, man, we talked about a lot here. Uh, we, I said I'd get it done in an hour. I'm sorry, we ran over a little bit. I've I added some new things since this morning about, uh, because of some questions that came up. It still comes down to, though, being careful. If you are not careful, virus protection software will not save you, and you'll run into a problem. If you see anything unusual, if it seems like it's too good to pass by, it's probably a problem. If it seems like you can make a lot of money quickly, run from it. You don't want to be sucked in by something that is just too good to be true. So that's, those are the things to watch out for. One last thing, another good website, stopthinkconnect.org. They have great tips and advice on staying safe on the website. And just a reminder, two weeks from today, we have another seminar coming up. Don't be a victim of your own good intentions. On the internet, people, as I mentioned, are usually going after your vices. This seminar talks about mail solicitations, phone solicitations, many of which are targeted at seniors, and here they go after your good intentions, your, your desire to help people. And so that'll be two weeks, same time, same locations, Monday at, uh, on April 13th. So I hope to see you there. So we're now ready for questions. We've been talking about scams and fraud and deception there's a famous book that some people claim is filled with deception, contradictions, myth, and fiction. And some claim that it's a powerful book that has led people off into an irrational religion of blind faith. This book is the Bible. Look at the claims of the most famous person in the Bible, Jesus Christ. People say that, well, Jesus was a great teacher, and he is. People say that he showed us how to love one another, and he does. People say his life is the role model where to follow, and it is. But, but if Jesus is a liar, or if he was crazy, 
then none of this is true. He can't be a great teacher if he was not teaching truth, if he just made stuff up. Jesus straight out claimed to have the attributes of God. He claimed to be God. He did things that only God can do. That means he's either a liar, a lunatic, or our Lord God. In the Gospel of John, the facts are laid out. John demonstrates that Jesus is God, and that what Jesus taught about us is true. We're sinners. That means we've broken God's laws. And you know what? Our conscience tells us that that is true. The question isn't, have you ever told a lie? It is, how many lies have you told? How many times have you taken things that don't belong to you? How many times have you looked at another person with lust? You see, Jesus said in Matthew 5 that if you look with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. Those are just three of the Ten Commandments. The Bible tells you that if you have broken just one of God's laws, it is if you have broken them all, and you deserve the just punishment, God's wrath, eternity, in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur. But God so loved the world, God so loved you, that he gave his only son. Christ died on the cross. You see, the penalty for disobeying God is the death penalty. But Christ died on the cross, taking the full punishment for all that you've done wrong. In every way that you've disobeyed God, Christ took that punishment on himself. And he did this as a free gift for you. Now, if it's a gift, you have to accept the gift and believe that he's really given you this gift. And God does not force you to accept this gift. God does not force you to believe any of this is true. But if you truly trust Jesus Christ, if you truly trust that he paid the penalty you owe for disobeying God, that you owe for everything you've done wrong, if you believe Jesus Christ paid the penalty you earned and you repent, which means to turn away from disobeying God and make him your boss, your Lord, then you get all of this as a free gift. And to prove this is true, Jesus Christ not only died, and there's no doubt that he was dead. The Romans were experts at this. Jesus was dead. He was buried. And then to prove that everything he promised is true, on the third day, he rose from the dead, showing you, proving to you, demonstrating that everything, everything he said was true. And there truly is life after death. Life that you can have if you trust that Jesus fully paid your death penalty. That he died in your place so you can live. That's why John 3.16 is such an important verse. It summarizes all of this. For God so loved the world. For God so loved you. That he gave his only son, Jesus, to die on the cross that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Eternal life is yours if you trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So please, please put your trust in the one who is trustworthy, Jesus Christ. Trust Jesus.